uh, a few minutes in. Thank you for everybody for joining our Home Buying 101 seminar. Uh, first one that we're hosting for 2023. Uh, hopefully uh, more to come uh, later this year as well. Uh, what I'd like to do is do some quick introductions for the panelists that are going to be sharing great information today. And do we have the slide deck up, our wonderful host? All right. So this is opportunity to introduce myself. My name is Lawrence Leung. I'm one of the co-founders of Kiop and uh, been in the industry for quite some time now, well over 30 years, um, doing a lot of sales, a lot of property management, and a lot of investments. And hopefully some of that uh, knowledge and experience will come over today as we sh begin to share some uh, useful tips, some useful information related to home buying, and if it's your first time, uh, what that really means, what you need to know to be best prepared to enter the real estate market, okay? So with me today is Nathan, who is on our sales team. Uh, he's been with our company for almost three years now. Licensed realtor, uh, specializes with buyers. There he is right there. Uh, I'll let him share a little bit more about himself. Hey guys, uh, so my name is Nathan and yeah, like Lauren said, I've been with Kiop for almost uh, three years now. Uh, licensed realtor, I'm a buyer specialist. I've been in the client service industry for eight plus years. Um, I also uh, am a leasing manager for our, um, our property management side as well. So I oversee all the leasing aspects of our uh, properties and take care of all the vacancies, but very experienced in sales, property management and investments. Um, little personal fact about me. I'm also bilingual in English and Thai. And very excited to teach you guys about the home buying process. And I have to say, I'm not, uh, I'm not fluent in Thai, <laughs> nor am I fluent in Chinese, but we do have uh, members of our team that are fluent. And the next uh, guest that we're going to have today is a very uh, important one because it's a uh, a key part of the home buying process. It's all about loans. So Evan has been partnering with us for quite some time, and I'm going to let Evan introduce himself. Hi, my name is Evan Wong. I'm a mortgage banker for U.S. Bank. Um, have over 10 years in uh, lending experience, uh, specialized in first-time home buyers. Uh, helped a lot of folks buy their first house, second house, investment properties, um, fluent in Cantonese and um big warriors and niners fans so i'm pretty happy today uh, considering we got a game six tomorrow you don't just have uh, game six you have a game seven coming uh back to the bay area well one, one game at, at a time <laughs> <laughs> all right let's uh get into the topics for today so the home buying process can be actually a very involved process and there's a lot of information to share uh, what we're going to try and do is share the most relevant information a big portion of which is um, the lending side because lending does become an important important piece in trying to purchase a home but we are going to try and provide you a market update at a high level uh, explain to you why you're really uh, wanting to buy a home obviously you guys have your own reasons but to uh, solidify what those reasons are and to put a little bit more flavor into uh, additional reasons that you might not be aware of as to why you should buy um, in general, as well as why you should be buying now. And we'll talk about the process of home buying a little bit, at least covering the front end portion of the process and leaving the back end portion of the process for another seminar because that gets really involved when we start talking about the escrow and closing side. But let's uh, let's get into the meat and potatoes. Let's get into the market. And that's what a lot of people are really interested about. Most of the time when we're hoping, hosting open houses, most of the time when we're talking to clients, the question always comes up, how's the market? A very generalized question, right? But it, it, it conveys so much information when uh, people are asking. Sometimes when they ask, they really don't know what they're looking for. At the end of the day, 
are they wondering how's the market with respect to home prices? How's the market in terms of, is it a buyer's market? Is it a seller's market? Or for a lot of people right now, the interesting piece is how are interest rates, right? And obviously, Evan can talk a little bit more about interest rates. Um, but what we do know is that we're in an inflationary um, market condition, right? Uh, interest rates are going up and the Fed continues to raise interest rates in order to fight inflation. And while they're not exactly uh, directly tied, they are correlated. So as interest rates rise, it does affect the 10-year bond, which is what mortgage interest rates are more closely tied to. And so that's why you see rising interest rates. But interest rates alone doesn't really give you the entire picture. Um, when we look at the market conditions and we look at whether it's a seller's market or whether it's a buyer's market, you really can't put a, a pin on it. Um, some people say it's a seller's market because there's so much buyer demand. And surprisingly, there is a lot of buyer demand, even though interest rates are going up or are historically higher than they have been in the past. Uh, some would say that it's actually a buyer's market because um, sellers are facing lower demand than they have traditionally, right? So to, to be honest, it's almost a to each their own. Um, some people consider it a buyer's market. Some people consider it a seller's market. Uh, what it comes down to you is what I'm going to allude to in a little bit, which is it really depends on the type of property that you're really looking at. If you're looking at a certain type of property like a condo, as an example, the condo market is still recovering from the pandemic when it took a significant downward pressure on the entire market with a lot of people leaving condos. And as a result, um, there's a high inventory and lower demand. And when you look at it from economics point of view, that ends up being a buyer's market for condos. Whereas in single family homes, a lot of people want to be in single family homes. So you see higher demand there. So you might consider that more of a seller's market uh, from that perspective. What a lot of people want to know also is what is the medium home price of a single family home and a condo? And the reality is we can't really give you an answer because it depends. And those two words are the worst words that people want to hear. But that is reality, right? The medium home price, when you see it in the news, is medium home price across all of that property type. For single family homes, it's everything. It's not in San Francisco, it's the entire Bay Area, unless they're looking specifically at San Francisco. And even in San Francisco, then they're looking at anything from a two bedroom all the way up to what X bedroom, right? So it doesn't really give you a clear picture. For a first time home buyer, however, you're not really looking to buy three bedroom home or four bedroom home. So mixing in those prices with two bedrooms doesn't really give you a clear picture. So you really wanna know if you're looking at a medium home price, what is a medium home price for a property type I'm looking for? And what you'll realize is that what's in the news is probably much higher than what it is for a normal first time home buyer. Same thing with the condo. Uh, you're gonna have smaller condos everything from a studio all the way up to three plus bedroom. And so the medium home price for a one bedroom or studio condo is gonna be vastly different than one for a two or three bedroom. And it's gonna be vastly different for a condo that is south of market versus a condo that's in um, the outer lying districts and neighborhoods of San Francisco. But that gives you at least a clearer picture, hopefully of what really makes up market conditions and what it looks like currently with higher interest rates, um, more demand with a lot of people looking for single family homes, um, less demand for those looking for condos. And that's where we're gonna start talking about specifics. And we'll talk about condos and TICs and different types of uh, home ownership a little bit later with Nathan. But as we start getting into home buying, one thing that comes up a lot for a lot of people are these five myths, right? It's 
I don't think I can afford it. Buying a home is unaffordable, or I need to be a millionaire to be able to afford a home. But the reality is uh, none of these are really true. Um, there is a little bit of truth, but for the most part, they are myths. Do you need to be a tech millionaire to buy a home? You certainly don't. And depending on the type of home, uh, you can buy a starter home for less than $500,000 in the Bay Area. In fact, Nathan can probably give you an example of a home he helped close on just last month. Was it last month? Yeah, last month, late last month for less than $500,000, actually less than $400,000, right? I think the reality is you don't have to be a tech millionaire and there are plenty of folks that live in the Bay Area that are not in tech. They're in other industries and they're in high paying uh, jobs and they're doing well and they can buy a home and it doesn't have to be a million dollar home or a $2 million home, right? Buying a home is unaffordable. It's something you probably hear about in the news all the time. It's probably something you hear about from friends and family. Buying a home doesn't have to be unaffordable. It can be affordable, and it goes back to the type of home you're buying and where you're buying the home. Obviously, if you're trying to buy a home that's in city center, close to where there's a lot of demand, close to where the medium home price is a lot higher, then it can become more unaffordable than affordable. But if you go out into our lying areas of San Francisco or even to other uh, areas of the Bay Area, the East Bay, the North Bay, even down in certain parts of the peninsula, you can find homes that are more affordable. So affordability is, at the end of the day, a sliding scale. And uh, based on how much you make, based on the type of property you're looking for, and based on where you want to live, uh, you can certainly find areas of affordability. I can't buy a home because I have student loan debt. I am going to put a pin in that and let Evan, our lender over at US Bank, talk about this a little bit more because he can give you a little bit more transparency and insight into what an underwriter really looks for when it looks for the financial uh, stability and resume of a borrower, right? And that's what really determines on what you can or can't afford. And just because you have a student loan debt doesn't mean you can't be able to buy a home, okay? Do you need perfect credit to get a loan? Again, something that Evan can dive a little bit deeper into, but the reality is you don't have to have perfect credit. Um, having perfect credit definitely helps, but there are a lot of loan products out there for folks that don't have the best credit, right? And similarly, when you talk about you needing a large down payment to buy a home, same thing. Uh, you don't have to have a large down payment, although it doesn't hurt, right? If you have family or you have a lot of money saved up, it definitely will help in terms of how much you have to borrow compared to the home that you're trying to purchase. But it doesn't mean that you have to have 40% down. It doesn't mean you have to necessarily have the traditional 20% that you commonly hear about uh, required to be able to purchase a home for traditional financing. There are programs that allow you to have as little as 3% down for certain types of loans or even less than that, depending on um, the type of borrower you are. Okay, So there are a lot of programs out there. And everyone's going to be able to get into that a little bit more when he uh, speaks more about the different loan products, the different programs that are available for first-time home buyers. But the good takeaway here is that there are a lot of myths out there about whether or not you can buy a home, and a lot of them tend to be false. And hopefully today we'll be able to uh, shed a little bit light on how you are going to be able to afford a home. As we get into the question of, well, now that we know that home affordability is a reality, you can get that elusive American dream. 
the question is, why should I buy now versus later? And the reason why you should buy really falls into three buckets that you see here, right? You have rising interest rates. And the idea around rising interest rates is that if they continue to rise, you want to be able to try and purchase something sooner rather than later, right? Because what you don't want to do is purchase something when the interest rates uh, get even higher in the future. The reality is if you are able to purchase something now, you can lock in a rate, well, not as low as they have been historically. Uh, you do know that in the future, you can always refinance. What you can't do in the future is you can't change what your purchase price is. And so when you think about how interest rates have affected home prices, rising interest rates have caused the home price to come down. And that's just part of plain uh, economics, supply and demand, right? Higher interest rates, lower demand, lower price point. And so if you're able to purchase a home at a lower price now, even though the mortgage interest rate is a little bit higher than it was three, five, 10 years ago, at least you purchase at a lower price point. And then in three, five, seven years, when interest rates um, hopefully will go back down in the future, you'll be able to refinance. And you'll be able to lock in that lower interest rate than what you start off with. And luckily at a lower purchase price, okay? So lock in now and refinance later is a strategy that you want to look towards versus trying to wait it out later. And when interest rates go down, then you're having to purchase at a higher, higher price point. Okay. The other bucket is building wealth. The reality is for a lot of homeowners, um, the reason why they bought a home is because it helps them build wealth over time. Uh, the home is by far the largest asset anyone has in their lives. And as you own that asset over time, the equity builds up. And the equity builds up through a couple different ways, right? It builds up through appreciation over time because homes just appreciate over time. And the average appreciation is about 2 to 3% every single year. You think about a home 10, 20, 30, even 40 years ago, it was significantly lower than it is today. And so you're going to expect that a home in 10, 20, 30 years is going to be significantly more than it is right now. The other part of equity building up is just the debt pay down, right? If you have a loan on a home, over time, you're going to pay off your loan. And as you pay off your own loan, you're going to own the home outright. And so that asset that you have, you own entirely, 100%. So... If you bought a home for a million dollars and you got a loan for $800,000 and you had a 30-year mortgage, in 30 years, you're ha you would have paid off all $800,000, right? And so that is equity building up over time, okay? And the last is just pride of ownership. Um, you have a home, you have stability for your family, you have security, and you do have some tax benefits through standardized deductions uh, on your property tax as well as your mortgage interest. So those are all great reasons why you do want to buy a home. And if you want to look at what the ultra uber wealthy do is they own real estate. And so you, you kind of look towards the folks that are successful in the real world, um, celebrities, sports athletes, CEOs, um, anybody that you look up to, uh, the one thing they have in common when it comes to building wealth is they all invest in real estate and they all own uh, their home. And so home ownership is, it is the American dream. And hopefully um, we'll be able to help show you how it's achievable and maybe even help you make that uh, a reality. What's the next slide that we have? Oh, this is perfect. I get to transition things over to Nathan. So Nathan can tell, tell us a little bit more about 
uh, condos and fractional ownership, especially since he just closed on transaction a little over uh, a week ago for a condo. Great. Thanks, Lawrence. Alrighty, uh, I'll take some work off your plate. <laughs> so should you buy a condo? What is a condo, right? A lot of you will probably know what a condo is as uh, first time home buyers are. Uh, a lot of them are looking to buy condos for many great benefits. So what is a condo, right? A condo is basically uh, an individual owns a unit inside like a large property, but you also have uh, shared ownership among amongst like common areas, like, you know, uh, the exterior of your unit. So if you have, you know, hallways, uh, amenities, stuff like that, you do have shared ownership um, uh, in those common areas. And they're typically managed by associations. So you have things like HOAs. Um, for especially for like larger complexes, uh, you'll definitely need you know an association to manage everything. Um, but overall, it's a great option for first-time home buyers, and there's a lot of pros that go with it, um, such as you know it's usually more affordable and a lot cheaper than single-family homes. So that's why it's very popular uh, with the first-time home buyers. Another great thing about condos is that there's less maintenance, so you are paying HOA fees each month, but a lot of those fees are going towards the, uh, the maintenance and repair work and then improvements to the building. So anything outside of it, those HOA fees are usually going uh, towards those things. And you don't really have to worry about, you know, the exterior, like for a uh, single family home, right? You have to worry about the roof. Um, you have to worry about the, the landscaping, everything outside of your unit. But with condos, it's really popular because you, you don't have as much responsibility as like a single family home. Uh, the amenities are a great pro with condos as well. And, you know, a lot of you guys know, you know, there's sometimes there's swimming pools, there's, um, business centers, gyms, stuff like that. So you get all of that in close proximity. And it's, uh, you know, it's, it, it is a lifestyle that a lot of first time home buyers want to, to pursue basically. And that's not something that you do get with um, other type of types of properties, um, like the single family homes. What also is an, another benefit is uh, staff, right? So usually condos, they do have, it's, you know, someone in front desk that can help you out. Um, security as well, and then, you know, house cleaning or, or something like that. Um, but it gives you a bit more peace of mind that everything is being managed outside of your unit. Um, another great thing about condos is that the location usually is in urban areas. So with San Francisco, a lot of people want to move here and they're moving here out of state because they want to live in the city, right? You want to experience the, the city life and the convenience is probably the most important thing. And with condos, they're typically located in urban areas. And, you know, usually you do get um, condos in downtown, a lot of them actually, and they're very close to grocery stores, you know, gym, if you don't have one inside the condo and a lot of other stores as well, and transit as well. Um, so that's why they're very popular. Some of the cons with condos is you guys know about, you know, association fees. So Association fees can be, you know, usually they have a bad reputation because you're paying additional on top of your mortgage, uh, you know, additional fee. And usually sometimes it's about 500 plus, but I've actually seen some condos that are charging around two or $300 per month. So it just really depends on what type of property that you're looking to purchase in. But with the association fees, they're actually very handy because one, you are purchasing the property at a lower price than you know the, the, the single family homes. And then two, those association fees go towards, like I mentioned before, they go towards the maintenance um, and then just the upkeep of the, the property. So you don't really have to worry about all those things except for the maintenance and repair inside your unit. So definitely it is a, a great, it's, it is a, it has a bad reputation, but there are benefits of the association fees. Another con too that can steer people away are the rules and regulations for condos. And I sometimes, <laughs> I, I get YouTube recommendations. Uh, Cause one time I watched like a, a video uh, from the news about like 
HOA horror stories. So there are some bad repu- uh, there is a bad reputation out there, but actually the rules and regulations are there in order to serve as kind of like a, a guidance or law within the, the building. And it's, it's really handy because, uh, you know, you need those rules and regulations in order to basically be a good neighbor, right? There's some rules about noise control and, you know, what to do um, with uh, the, your property, what you can't do with your property in order to maintain the value as well. So we, you do need these things, especially if you're living in a large complex, because without these rules and regulations, it's kind of chaos, right? Uh, so that's why they're there. But you do want to make sure that you're fully reviewing with your agent all the, the, the CCNRs, which has these rules and regulations in there. You want to make sure you're fully reading through them so you understand and agree to all the terms and conditions uh, when living at the property. Because there are sometimes there could be some restrictions that you need to know about. That way you don't get, you know, violation or fine in the future. Limited privacy and then limited outdoor space. I don't really think this is much of a con because when you're going into condos, you do pretty much know what you're getting into, right? Obviously, you're most likely going to be sharing wall to wall with another owner, another neighbor. Um, And then the outdoor space is limited to maybe like a balcony or an outside uh, patio. But you do get, you know, the shared ownership of like a rooftop or something or, a, you know, a common area outdoor space. So I wouldn't consider that a, a con. I would just say that, you know, it's, it's mostly well known that you are going to be limited to those things when you move into a condo. And then lastly, one of the cons is uh, appreciation. So condos do appreciate, but they don't appreciate as much as a single family home does. Uh, it's, it is a fact, but it's, I wouldn't, I wouldn't think too heavily about it because condos still do appreciate, but the most important thing is that you realize that there is great value in owning your own home. And that's basically, you know, what we're, we're trying to convey over here. Um, and it's the, like I said, it's a great first time home buyer option. And that's why it's very popular uh, among uh, San Francisco residents. And next we can talk about a TIC. So what is a TIC? So TIC textbook definition, it's basically um, multiple individuals uh, share ownership of the single property. Uh, but each owner has a uh, separate and undivided interest in the property. So kind of like percentages. Um, so one owner, you know, has more of a percentage ownership than the other ones, depending on uh, what unit. You are assigned a unit, basically. So it's kind of like, imagine you and, and a group of friends, um, you know, banded together to buy a property. So you guys will be, you guys will own that property. Uh, but you do get your separate interests or ownership. And it actually is uh, getting pretty popular in San Francisco because of the affordability, because they are a lot cheaper than the other properties out there and uh, some condos as well. And TICs are, so stands for tenancy in common, just to backtrack a little bit. So TICs are usually, they have smaller buildings and units, um, you know, I've seen TICs with four or five units in them, and that seems to be generally uh, the pattern. But uh, yeah, the one of the big pros is the affordability aspect, and it is the, the increased ownership influence, which means that since it's such a small um, it's such a small group of people that own the property, you do get uh, a little bit more flexibility with terms and conditions you put into the TIC versus a bigger apartment complex that's managed by an association, you kind of are bound by, you know, whatever the rules and conditions are, the rules and regulations, sorry. Uh, So with TICs, you do have a bit of uh, flexibility with the, the terms and, you know, it's based on the needs of the owners inside the building. 
And the cons of a TIC is shared responsibility and risk. So TIC owners share the financial risk associated with the property, um, including like the payments, um, property taxes, and then like the maintenance costs as well. With uh, TICs, there are limitations to fa financing. And then, you know, maybe Evan can uh, touch up a bit about this, but uh, some lenders uh, are not, they don't want to finance TIC. So you do have to find specific lenders that do TIC financing. So your, your limit, um, there is a limitation in trying to, you know, afford or find funding for a TIC. Okay. And next slide. Perfect. So why should I partner with a realtor? Big question is why not, right? So I get this question that uh, gets asked all the time by people in my circle and clients that I have a consultation with. So the main question is, what do I owe you, right? Simple answer is nothing. So you don't owe me anything on top of the what is already in the purchase price. So that means that you're not paying me any additional commission on top of what you're going to be paying for the purchase price. The reason is because the sellers are paying the commission to the buyer agent and their own listing agent as well. And in a way you can argue that it is, you know, you are paying the, um, paying the commission in the purchase price, but since a lot of the sellers are using realtors already in order to sell their property, you know, might as well just work with a realtor that is an expert at the market and expert in the home buying process and can guide you in the right direction. And it's a, uh, it's a very common mis misconception because I think people believe that they have to pay an additional, you know, three or 6% on top of the home purchase price in order to afford a realtor. But that, that's not the case. Um, the key information to know here is that the seller pays for the buyer and seller uh, commissions. So you're basically just paying for the purchase price and working with um, a professional. So really there's no reason to not work with a realtor at all. And without a realtor, basically you'll feel lost in the complex process. Uh, it's a lot of different things, a lot of different moving uh, puzzles and pieces, and you need someone that is experienced, uh, experienced and well-versed in the whole process in order to guide you uh, in the right direction and make the, the sound decisions. And you could read up all about the process, right? But the textbook does not really equate to real life experiences that we are exposed to on a daily basis. Um, so definitely, you know, work with a, a realtor in order to find your, um, your next home. And this is exactly why you should work with a realtor. Because when I take a look at this, I get anxiety. There's so many bubbles. Look, I, you know, it's, it's a very confusing process and um, we're gonna even simplify it uh, even more for you in the next slide. All right, so we did you guys a favor and we uh, made this a linear graph and simplified it even more for you. So home buying process, first step that you wanna do is find a realtor that you trust. Right. And then this can be from your network or, you know, a good experience um, with uh, someone that, you know, that's a realtor. Uh, next step you want to do is have a consultation with the realtor. And this is going to be directed by the person, um, by, sorry, by the realtor. And basically your consultation is going to discuss about all your needs and all your preferences. Right. That includes like your budget, um, you know, think your criteria, uh, must haves. Um, and all those, uh, all those uh, different things. So with my buyer consultation, it usually takes about like an hour and we sit down in the office or somewhere quiet where I can really show you and ask you questions about, um, you know, what exactly are your needs? My, my type or my method in doing these consultations is that I'm going to ask you 500 questions, but I'm going to show you 
five properties versus asking you five questions and show you 500 properties. And I really like to spend time to sit down with you, get to know you, and really understand what your needs are. So that way I can find you homes that fit your criteria. I'm not really going to ask 500 questions, but you guys, you guys get the, <laughs> the gist of it. Uh, but it's a very important uh, uh, step in the process. And then we kind of outline everything that you should be expecting, um, like the general like home buying process, what documents that you need to, to get ahead of time in order to make an offer. Uh, and then the next step we're going to do is finding a lender for you. So you need to obtain a, a pre-approval from a lender. So it states you know, how much the loan amount is and then basically what the maximum purchase price is that you can afford. And uh, you know, lenders, trusted lenders like Evan do a great job with that and he can help you find you know, exactly what fits your needs at the moment. Um, you can ask about like special programs that they have. Um, and then you know, we'll, we'll work in order to find you a, a competitive uh, interest rate as well. Next, we go ahead and select and view homes. So based on your criteria, we're going to select a few properties. We're gonna look on the MLS, which has the most recent um, and then updated listings on there. And what's great about that too, is that we're able to see all of the um, uh, inactive or uh, sorry, off market listings. Those are not listed in Zillow or Redfin. So that way we can see anything that's off market and on top of that, coming up soon as well. And we actually have like a cool app that we use um, where uh, we register our clients and we're able to see all the, the listings that they like and then send over the listings all within the app. Everything's communicated in there. Uh, and it's it's a great way to, you know, get a, get a sense of exactly what they want. And it just involves a lot more collaboration in the home looking or home viewing process. So, what happens if you really like a property, right? You write an offer and uh, we're gonna get into the specifics of that uh, soon. Next, we accept the, the contract inspections. Uh, once the offer has been accepted, we enter something called like the ratification stage, has a bunch of moving pieces that goes together. There's a lot of parties that are involved and it can be very perplexing, but we have a set process in place that we can do this very efficiently and very fastly as well to make sure that we are meeting all the, uh, the deadlines and then contingencies as well for you. So that way we're not making, um, you know, we're not missing a step. And basically everything over here up until close and record will be part of the uh, ratification process. And then Evan can talk a bit more about the, the loan processing as well. Um, but yeah, basically after that, we close and then uh, record your title and then you receive the keys to the property. And if we can go over to the next slide. So making an offer, uh, you do have to consider some factors into this as well. And the first one being the price. So what we'll do is that we'll do a market analysis in order and we'll, you know, research, do a thorough comprehensive research on recently sold in the market, um, all the details in order to uh, draft up a purchase offer with the, you know, recommended price. Sometimes you're going to be in situations where a, a property is very popular, right? And then it's it's going to go above asking price. So we'll disclose that and then get you ready uh, to set expectations for those situations as well. But we're going to do our due diligence and research, you know, what exactly is the, um, the best price to put in the offer for you. And for the terms, um, it's basically just, you know, when the offer deadline is, uh, what the closing date, um, what your uh, earnest money deposit is going to be. Uh, so just to ex set expectations, the deposit is needed in order to make an offer. So usually it's about 3% uh, of the purchase price. And that kind of just shows that, you know, you're very interested and you want to move forward with purchasing the property. Uh, we also go over, you know, who pays what, uh, 
there are um, there are set guidelines about what the seller and the buyer pays as well. But we use we use all of these things together in our negotiation. We assess the the situation, and when and then we consult with you in order to make these negotiations with the the seller um, to our benefit or in order to make a very strong offer as well. And for contingencies, um, this is all in the purchase contract, but contingencies, they're very important. Consider kind of like a get out of jail card, right? Because there are basically um, certain things that when you're putting in an offer, you want to put in certain contingencies that if those are not met, you do have a chance to back out. So something like financing contingency, um, right? If you don't get the financing uh, for the property, then you have a chance to, to back out. Like inspection contingency as well. If you find, if you perform an inspection on the property and then you find something, you know, you can either ask the seller to, to fix it, repair it, or you have uh, your get out of jail card. Uh, which is, uh, you know, you can back out of the offer. What's really important to note is that when you make an offer and that the seller accepts it, that is a binding contract. So you are bound to the terms of that purchase offer. Um, so very important to know. And uh, not a lot of people uh, realize that. So before you make an offer, you really need to know that this is, you know, this is the one that I really want. And I want to move forward with it, but it's very important to put these contingencies into place because that way you have, you know, you have a chance to back out of it. All right. So ingredients for a winning offer. Um, there are, you know, we will work together in order to analyze the situation and come up with the most competitive price and terms. Uh, you want to make sure that you review and sign all the disclosures. So we'll facilitate all of that for you. Uh, we'll send all, all of the uh, disclosures. We'll review everything, provide you a summary. So that way you are, um, you know of the, the key facts and information. Um, a lot of it is a boilerplate, but we're really trained in taking a look at, you know, exactly what you need to know about the, the property in order to make an informed decision. You'll need that pre-approval letter that I mentioned about as well, proof of funds. And then the last one is a very cheesy type of um, uh, letter, I would say. So I, I do always request my clients to write up like the cheesy, cheesiest letter that they could about, you know, why they love this property. Like, you know, when I walked into it, I fell in love with it right away. I could see my kids running around, stuff like that. And it's going to be like the cheesiest thing you ever uh, written, but it's really important because at some point it needs to become emotional for the seller, right? And they, they need to make, uh, they need to feel good about, you know, selling their property and handing it over to you. So I do, uh, that is a requirement for um, my, uh, my uh, buyer consultations is to go over that and then have the buyers prepare that. Great. And Evan, you wanted to talk, uh, do you want to talk about maintaining pre-approval? Yeah, so um, let's, let's go, uh, let's just skip this slide and go straight down to uh, slide 27. Uh, back up one more. So um, I just want to give you guys a quick overview on the, the loan process and a few tips uh, before you start your pre-approval. Um, go down to slide 28, please. Uh, one more forward, please. Yeah, so first, first thing when starting a pre-approval is uh, making sure your credit is in good shape. Um, Few things that you can control is to pay down your credit cards. Generally, when you have less than thirty percent utilization, your credit score will um, will increase. Um, you also want to avoid big purchases that re require financing, uh, so such as like car loans, uh, car leases, uh, timeshares. Uh, anything that requires you to pull your credit and put your name onto that product. Um, 
go down one more slide, please. Got it. So five things that make up your credit score. You have your, how many new lines of credit you, you opened up in the last few years. You have the type of credit, so student loans, credit cards, uh, car loans. Um, bigger credit, such as car loans, generally affect your credit score. Um, so like if you have a car loan that you paid off in the last five years, generally your credit score is going to be better. Um, payment history, uh, generally you don't want to have any missed payments with, within the last 12 months. Um, and again, debt, uh, keep your credit card balances below 30% if, if you can. Um, go down one more slide, please. Okay. Sorry, slides aren't matching up. Um, yeah, so determine how much you could afford. Um, when talking to a mortgage banker, um, there's two things that we generally do, pre-qualification and pre-approval. Pre-qualification is where we have a detailed conversation about your scenario and figure out how much you qualify for. So this process, we don't really pull credit, but we just ask generalized questions such as how much income you make, how much assets you have saved up, um, do you have any car loans, student loans, and you kind of, kind of paint a picture on how much you could afford. If you're, if that number fits into your needs, that's when we kind of start the pre-approval process. That's when we pull credit, uh, look at your income and asset documentation, um, just fill out all the details you need to to um, generate that pre-approval letter. Um, give me one sec. And Okay, perfect. Go down to uh, slide 37. Thank you. So during the pre-approval process, I'll also um, review different loan products you have. Um, general mortgage products is the fixed rates. So you people who are purchasing a first property generally look at 30-year fixes. Um, that's pretty self-explanatory. The interest rate will stay the same for the next 30 years. Um, then, and then there's also adjustable rate mortgages. Adjustable rate mortgages are fixed for a certain amount of time, five, seven, or 10 years. Um, this is a good way to lock yourself in, into a lower uh, interest rate. So let's just say right now interest rates are high. Um, you buy your property you lock yourself in for a seven year adjustable. It, it's just with six uh, lower amount for seven years. Um, and then rates fall in two years. You could refinance into a 30 year fix, get yourself into a lower uh, interest rate. Um, and then we also have FHA loans or VA loans. FHA loans allows you to put a little bit less down payment um, as low as three and a half percent. And then we also have VA loans, which allow you to put zero percent down um, both these products are are great but they do have a little bit more nuances to uh to those loans let's see um, and interest rates interest rates i'll give you a rough estimate on today's interest rates but generally i tell my clients not to fixate too much on interest rates because it's something that you can't control um, interest rates rise and fall on a daily basis. So you can't actually get the interest rate that I'm offering you until you actually have a purchase contract in hand. So you submit an offer, they say, hey, we accept your offer. That's the only time you're able to lock in an interest rate. Um, Besides that, it's kind of just cold. Um, if you plan on shopping around for interest rates, I highly recommend shopping around when you get in the contract, not kind of during the pre-approval process because you don't want multiple lenders pulling your credit scores and uh, dinging your score or whatnot. Um, next slide, please. Perfect. Um, so start the loan application. Everything is um, done electronically now. 
Um, once you're ready to start the loan application, we'll send you a link to apply. You can fill out the application uh, on your phone or your or your computer. Um, and that's when disclosures will be generated to you. Uh, so we have just general disclosures, um, loan estimates, kind of the terms, kind of giving you like a breakdown of what to expect in terms of uh, how much to pay. Um, also gives you an estimate on upfront fees and how much your appraisal cost, um, title, et cetera. Um, let's see. Perfect. Cool. Um, sorry, next slide, please. So after you submit your application, um, generally the loan officer will ask for a bunch of documentation. Kind of depends on your scenario, so how you're employed. But general items are W-2s, pay subs, tax returns, and bank statements. Um, we basically send these items to the underwriter to approve your loan. Um, kind of depends on the process. Um, you could get a fully underwritten pre-approval letter, which means you don't have a house, but you want to make sure you're good for lending. And you could send your file to the underwriter to fully approve then, or we could send your file to the underwriter once you get in your contract. Right now, how competitive the market is, majority of my clients are getting fully underwritten. So when they're submitting the offer, they know 100% they're good for the funds from the bank. Um, that's a route that I generally recommend just because it kind of takes away a lot of the nervousness in terms of making an offer and getting the loan. Um, and that's getting a fully underwriting, a fully underwritten pre-approval letter generally takes probably three days or so. So it's something that you want to um, start a little bit, a little bit on the earlier side. Um, next slide, please. So once you're in contract, you submit your income and asset documentation, um, underwriter fully review the documents, they'll issue a final approval. Once they issue a final approval, you're, it basically means you're good for the loan. Um, the next step would be generating a loan or a closing cost, uh, closing disclosure. Closing disclosure is basically like a big receipt breaking down your entire transaction. Um, it shows, how much the how much uh, fees you're paying to the lender, how much fees you're paying to the title company. Highly recommend reviewing these documents in detail because there's really no changing it once you sign your loan documents. Um, so highly recommend reviewing the closing disclosure once it's released. Um, and that should be it. Let's see. Next slide, please. Okay, close and sign. Yeah, so once the closing disclosures are released, you have three days to review your loan um, closing disclosure. Once that three days is up, you sign your loan documents. Um, signings right now are were typically done in the title office, but now since with COVID and people's uh, busy schedules, they're usually done with a, with a mobile notary. So a mortar will go to your, your house or wherever you're living at and help you sign your loan documents. Um, once that's done, 24 to 48 hours, you'll have keys in hand. That should be it. Thank you, Evan, for all the great information. Uh, it looks like we have about seven questions, and I know we're about three minutes over, so I'm going to try and get through these questions as quickly as possible. That way we can get uh, the right information to the folks that were asking the questions. So, Kat, did you want to ask the questions one at a time, or what would you like to do? Our Kat is our uh, hostess with the most that's in the a background that's helping us with the slides and the music. Uh, it looks like the first question is, how do you calculate closing costs? Um, <laughs> that's a pretty loaded question. It really depends on where you're buying the property. Um, some counties don't have transfer taxes. 
uh, I mean, some counties uh, transfer taxes are paid by the sellers or they split between the sellers and the buyers. Um, I generally just give a rule of thumb. Um, typically, closing costs will range between ten to fifteen thousand. Um, once you're in contract and kind of follow along in the process, that's when the bank's going to kind of give you a rough estimate on how much to expect. So right now, if you're buying a property, I'll just say, hey, down payment plus ten thousand for your closing costs or any related item. So um, everything that Evan said, spot on. But what I will say is that um, closing costs encompasses a lot of different things for a buyer, title insurance, um, a number of escrow fees. If you decide to have a mobile notary versus uh, in, uh, doing a notary in person, all those end up uh, being additional costs. And you can definitely work with your escrow officer who ends up being assigned to your transaction to find out ways to try to minimize it. But there will be a minimum that you will have to do in terms of not only what your title insurance is based on your purchase price, but also uh, the standard customary uh, escrow uh, fees for processing your escrow. The next question is, what if I really love the house I'm currently renting? What is the best way to come into contact with the landlord and propose to buy the house? So what I will say is that um, as Kiop, uh, we're not only a real estate company, we also do property management, as many of you know, and we manage a lot of properties and a lot of those properties end up at some point in the future being sold. And so if it's a home that you love, then it's a conversation that we can help you with broaching with the owner. Uh, what I will say is that a lot of that really depends on timing, right? Uh, when we work with our owners, we work on educating them on when it's a good time to sell. And that usually uh, factors in how long they've owned the home, meaning do they still have a loan on the home? Has it been fully paid off? Uh, have they lost all their depreciation? There are a lot of investment um, elements to that decision. And those are things that we would have to have that conversation with owner to uh, let them know, is it a good time to sell or is it uh, a good time to continue to rent? So reach out to us if it's uh, a home that we're managing. If it's not home we're managing, feel free to reach out to us anyway, and then we can explain to you those other elements about uh, when it is a good time to sell and when you can have that conversation with the owner. Uh, one thing you can do is you can check out our investment seminar that we had, was it last month? It's all a blur, maybe uh, a little over a month ago. And that actually goes into a little bit more detail as to when you should invest and what are the things that you're really looking for when you invest. And a lot of it has to be, or a lot of it has to do around depreciation and uh, leveraging or your loan. Can any part of the down payment be paid in cash? <laughs> uh, I would say talk to a mortgage banker. Um, banking, uh, lending is very regulated. So Kind of has to be tracked. Uh, definitely talk to a mortgage bank to kind of to kind of figure out the details. But generally, cash is very hard to use uh, as part of the transaction. There's a Evan. There's a, a term that a lot of people use, um, making sure that money exists in your accounts uh, for a certain amount of time, having things funds that are seasoned. Can you uh, describe that a little bit? Yeah, so basically when the bank reviews your assets, they look for, they look at the last two months and they're looking for any type of like large transactions. So generally when you're starting the pre-approval process, you don't want to uh, have any like large transfers because what happens is you transfer 50,000 to one account, from one account to another. I, I'm gonna say, hey, can you show me documentation showing that, that 50,000 is yours? And a lot of transfers just creates a lot of paperwork. So again, I really recommend um, having a conversation with a mortgage bank to kind of figure out the, the paper trail. Um, so 
seasoning is not really required as long as you're able to document the transfers. Um, and you could say if you're in some of the trouble, you just skip transferring for two months so you don't have to document anything. Because we usually only go back two months. Okay, uh, next question. Is it better to get a loan through a big bank, a smaller bank, or an individual? Um, I would say the big bank because I work for a big bank. Uh, <laughs> but it, it depends. Uh, I generally tell my clients to work with somebody you're comfortable with. That's number one, just because there's a lot of sensitive information that gets uh, exchanged during the process. So if I did a, did a loan for you, I basically know every piece of personal information. Your name, your phone number, your email, your address, your social security number, your date of birth. Really recommend uh, working with somebody you trust. Um, big bank, small bank, I don't really think it matters too much. Um, I generally look at working with who you're comfortable with and who's giving you a little bit of risk. Yeah, I think uh, I'll add a little bit more of opinion on this. Uh, I agree. Um, working with a well-established bank does have its benefits, right? They can oftentimes uh, close on time um, without many issues. Um, the underwriting process is a little bit more controlled and predictable. What I will say is that at the end of the day, for all of us here on the panel, we just want to make sure that you guys are able to, if you want to purchase home, be able to purchase home, whether that's you know, with a big bank, with a smaller bank, with seller-backed financing. So if you want the seller to help finance, uh, there are a lot of creative ways for financing and a lot of creative ways to purchase your home. And not every borrower is the same. Um, some folks like to uh, go with a smaller bank because they will hold the loan on their own books, what they call portfolio loan versus bigger banks that sell it back to Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac. And so in those situations, they have a little bit more flexibility with certain types of borrowers. Like if you're a business owner versus a W-2 employee, if you're a very um, uh, triple A um, borrower, meaning you have excellent credit, your financials are impeccable, then you can go with any bank that gives you the best rate. But then there are some borrowers that might not have as good a credit. And so they need... Uh, other programs or other types of financing to make it work. And so, you know, working with Evan, he'll be able to lay that all out for you and uh, put you on the best path to home ownership. Uh, looks like next question is, if I were to buy a $1 million home, how much to expect for to spend on down payment plus closing costs? Uh, I would estimate 210000 $200,000 for the 20% plus eight or 9,000 for uh, closing cost related items. Yeah. Again, it, it depends on like if you're buying points and all that, but generally, um, yeah, no points. You're, I don't, I don't see you spending more than 210,000. How much does it cost to make an offer in a, on a house? If you don't get chosen, how much money are you throwing away on the offer? and application. So I would say Nathan should be able to answer this one. You guys are gonna like this answer. Nothing, zilch, nada. It is <laughs> so <free. laughs> Your agent will will make that offer for you. Um, they will write up that offer, you submit it, and basically it gets accepted um, mm -hmm. or rejected, or they can do something like a, um, a seller counter offer, right? Um, but it doesn't cost anything to, um, you know, to, to make an offer. So you don't have to worry about that. I will add that um, Go it's ahead. good to make an offer of, you know, a few times just to get your feet wet, not to not be serious with an offer, but to actually go through the process and understand it. It's always very helpful. Even if at the very end, you don't actually submit it in, to go through the process of drafting up an offer with a realtor, a real estate agent, to understand the contingencies, understand the pricing strategy is all very, very important and useful. But to Nathan's point, doesn't cost you a dime. 
all it costs is your time and effort to work with your uh, professional realtor and the time it takes to review all the documents and all the disclosures and things like that. Yeah. And then we'll, we'll go over everything like the purchase contract. So we'll make sure that, you know, you, you are well aware of everything that's on there and you understand all the terms and conditions. Um, and, you know, if you guys have any questions uh, about the purchase contract and the offer, definitely uh, we're here to help answer those. And just you to, want to take the next, oh, Evan? Just to piggyback on how much it costs, um, it doesn't cost you anything to get pre-approved from our bank. So you know, there's no fees to to get fully underwritten or uh, to talk to a mortgage banker. So, yeah. Why don't you take the next one, Nathan? I am a, a so Anna asked, uh, I am a assuming buyer. I am assuming a buyer will always ask for an assessment of the house. Um, pipes. Pipes are working, roof is in good condition and things like that. Sorry, I forgot my glasses. <laughs> Yes, uh, and then those are available. Um, usually the, the listing agent will have the disclosures ready um, or they're, they're working on the disclosures. So we'll have all those available and they're, they're very long. It's like a comprehensive disclosure packet that has like a bunch of mandatory forms and disclosures. Uh, so we'll read through all that for you and then we'll analyze everything, especially the a home inspection. And we'll provide you like a summary of these are the the things to that you know will affect the value of the home or you're gonna have to pay uh you may have to pay out of pocket in the future for it right um if the roof is 20 plus years old right uh you're going to have to to work on uh, replacing or repairing it um you know in the next few years stuff like that but we'll let you know everything that you need to be aware of and things that don't really matter in the inspection report. I think to add on to what Nathan said, I think a lot of times uh, what he um, what he alluded to in terms of a disclosure package that's prepared by um, the seller or the listing agent will always have inspect. Well, I, I I misspoke. Will most of the time have inspections included on it. There are times where the seller doesn't want to do inspections and. In those times, your real estate agent will recommend you perform inspections as part of your due diligence process. So you do know what the condition of the pipes are. You do know what the condition of the roof is so that you can best make a decision on whether you do want to move forward and purchase a house or even submit an offer for that matter. It's kind of like gambling money, right? You put in <laughs> a little bit for, you know, putting down on an inspection so that way you don't have to take a bigger chunk out of your pocket later on. Uh, but you know, <laughs> if, if you have an inspection contingency, then you, you know, you can, if you find something uh, while you're doing the inspection, um, you can ask the seller to repair it or negotiate um, on the pricing and, and um, you know, the purchase. Uh, but you do have a little bit of a flexibility with um, negotiations. Joshua is asking, I'm really interested in buying a home, but I'm still waiting for the next housing market crash. Is it a great strategy? I currently have my own home, so my next purchase would be for my investment property. Can you give me some advice on what I should do? Well, let me get out my crystal ball. <laughs> <laughs> the reality is nobody can ever predict um, or time the market. It's just like the stock market. You can try to time it, but... Uh, you'll never necessarily be able to time it, or at least you'll never be able to time it all the all the time, or get it right uh, all the time. Um, but yes, the old adage um, and saying is true, which is you always want to buy low and you always want to sell high. Um, and you don't ever want to get in the uh, habit of you know feeling the fear of missing out, right, FOMO. Uh, and that goes back to Warren Buffett, who by far is one of the best uh, investment um, investors of all time, right? And he always said, when people are fearful, that's when you're greedy. And when people are greedy, that's when you should be fearful, right? So right now, a lot of people are scared of the market. 
and they don't know what's going to happen. And that gives you an opportunity to, you know, consider maybe it's a good time to go in when other people are scared, right? But given that you can't time the market, one thing you should always realize is no matter when you buy, you're buying not for a short-term strategy. It's always a long-term strategy or long-term hold. So you might buy a little bit higher, but when you look 30 years from now and you look back, you're going to realize, oh, wow, I bought at a much lower price, right? So it's all perspective. And, you know, reach out to us. We could talk about a little bit more um, what the investment strategy is. When we start looking at properties for an investment, you really start to get into a detailed analysis of each property that you're looking at. And it's no longer um, looking at it as like a home that you want to live in, something that you have a more emotional attachment to, something that uh, Nathan and the rest of the team are really good about is uh, making sure that you have a home that you're going to love and that um, you're going to be happy with for a long time. Investments are a different breed and that's uh, a different conversation that's sometimes a little bit longer. So definitely reach out. And the last question. Currently renting, feeling positive about it, but after listening to you talk, now I want to have my own home. I mentioned earlier, my rental fee is going nowhere compared to amortization, but my concern is what are the things that I need to consider on buying my own home? Do you think I can purchase my own home? My annual salary is 70000 Why don't you talk about the condo that you just helped our uh, an investor purchase? It was less than $400,000, um, a condominium in a great location. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, it's actually in Emeryville, and it's a very up-and-coming community. Uh, has a lot of great amenities, and nearby a lot of you know great shops and restaurants, and and the um, the mall as well, the shopping center. But you're gonna find that um, properties over uh, on the other side of the the bridge, East Bay, are a lot cheaper than the ones in uh, uh, in San Francisco or like the peninsula. And it's a really good place in order to, you know, make your first investment and home purchase. And it's not too far away as well. Um, but yeah, we, we were able to get uh, under uh, 400K for, um, it was uh, for a studio, but it was, uh, it's basically a very large studio. Um, I would even consider it like a junior one bedroom. Um, but I would just say that you want to make sure that you are crunching the numbers, talk to a lender, see exactly what uh, what mortgage payments, monthly mortgage payments you are comfortable with and kind of work backwards from that. Um, you know, uh, they'll talk about exactly, you know, how to budget and home payments, mortgage payments shouldn't be any more than, you know, 30 percent of your um, your take home uh, income. And. Emeryville was uh, the most recent uh, sale that Nathan had, but he found some really good places in Oakland, um, I think uh, near downtown uh, Lake, Mer Lake Merritt, I was about to say Lake Merced, uh, Lake Merritt, and also over in Concord, uh, three and two bedrooms that were below 400000 Yeah, so... Um, Concord is a yeah a little farther, but uh, usually lower in the purchase prices. But it was about a month ago, and I was seeing you know properties like one bedrooms in Oakland for around uh, low four hundreds. So it's a really good price, and there's a lot of things that that are out there on the market right now, and um, we're keeping our eyes on the market and finger on the pulse of the market, and we you know we know exactly when prices are being dropped by um, the seller, the listing agent. And, you know, we have a, a good, really good idea of like what's out there on the market. Um, so yeah, if you guys are, if you guys are interested, we definitely can send over some listings um, that might work for you. And then, you know, if you're interested, we can definitely um, schedule a time to go see it. Uh, another good example uh, that I'll leave you guys with. So you do realize that it's still a possibility to afford in San Francisco. Um, another member of our team, actually the head of our sales team, Melanie, she got into contract for a condo in the Richmond district. And that was 
listed at, I believe it was around $600,000. So um, there are still things that are well below 1 million, but um, you just have to find them. And working with somebody from our team, you'll be able to uh, get set up for some success in identifying and hopefully uh, making those uh, properties out there uh, your future home. Okay. Uh, I do want to thank everybody for joining today. Uh, thank you to Nathan and Evan for taking time out of their busy days to help us host this uh, informative webinar. And what our hostess with the mostest cat in the background is going to do is share a few more slides with you uh, for our upcoming seminars. Uh, we do have everybody's information, so that will get entered into a raffle where we're raffling off either a $250 or $200 gift card to Amazon or to Fogo de Chao. And that is going to be announced, uh, I believe it's in June when we do the drawing. So we collect all the attendees from all the different seminars that we host in the first half of the year. So uh, thank you um, very much for attending. Uh, we welcome your feedback on how we can continue to improve these seminars. So uh, if you have time, please do uh, send us uh, some feedback. We'd love to hear it and it'll continue to help us grow and keep on providing great useful information and seminars for you guys. All right. Have a great day. Enjoy uh, the rest of the week. Take care. Week. Bye.